Let's begin our voyage across the Smithsonian now and next. With a journey to the edge of the universe, please welcome Dr. Charles Alcock, director of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. At the Smithsonian, now and next are converging very quickly. We're on the brink of answering some of the most fundamental questions in the universe, including a truly earth-shattering one, are we alone? The investment of talent and technology required to answer this question is going to be enormous. But the answer will change history, not just science. And the Smithsonian will be leading the way. So first, I'd like to talk about our broad and deep commitment to understanding the universe. To do so, I'm going to violate the laws of physics and take you from them all to the edge of the universe in about 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Let's launch from one of our most beloved places, my favorite museum, which happens to be right next door, the National Air and Space Museum, where you can find the largest collection of historic aircraft and spacecraft in the world. Not to mention, of course, all of those goggle-eyed kids who could become our future astronomers and astronauts. From humble beginnings, when retired spacecraft and rockets were displayed outdoors on the mall, air and space is now home to over 60,000 priceless pieces of aviation history. This is where NASA sends its treasures to be lovingly looked after for future generations. From the great American story of our first trips beyond the atmosphere, to the first steps on the face of the moon, to a bouncy landing on the surface of Mars, the Air and Space Museum brings the wonders of the universe alive for the young and the young at heart. Teens who volunteer in the museum's explainers program play a key role in capturing the imaginations of these young minds, while at the same time making the wonder of scientific exploration and discovery accessible to all. Perhaps no single object has recently epitomized this ideal as well as the Space Shuttle Discovery. Here she is taking her last flight with a soaring and emotional victory lap over our nation's capital. The longest serving shuttle, Discovery flew 39 times from 1984 through 2011, including missions to Hubble and the International Space Station. She came to Earth, finally, at the Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center, a building designed specifically to showcase the glory of these enormous titans of flight. Here, Discovery has taken up a second life, teaching and inspiring a new generation of potential aviators and astronauts. Now let's venture to the other side of the mall and the National Museum of Natural History to get another perspective on the cosmos from clues that have fallen to Earth from space. This is their clean room, where scientists from all over can come and examine our collection of meteorites, 20,000 of them. Meteorites are basically rocky and metallic little messengers from space, remnants from when our solar system was just in its infancy. They tell us key information about how Earth, the Moon, and Mars took shape in their violent early days. But the Smithsonian's commitment to understanding space goes as far back as 1890 with the establishment of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. And 41 years ago, we teamed up with Harvard to create the Center for Astrophysics. Now our scientists and engineers have a hand in virtually every area of astronomy and cosmology. Venturing further afield on our journey, the spectacular images you have been seeing come to us courtesy of our orbiting X-ray telescope, Chandra, which has spent 15 years changing our views of the universe. The Smithsonian operates Chandra for NASA. We process the data, and we distribute it to scientists around the world for analysis. Here are images from Chandra that show us the glowing remains of exploded stars. In their fiery death throes, they leave behind beautiful and ghostly things, like this formation, nicknamed the Hand of God. And these are colliding galaxies. Now, when galaxies collide, no stars actually smack into one another. But huge gas clouds do, lighting up and sparking a baby boom of new stars. Even though X-rays are not visible to the human eye, these Chandra images are enhanced with color, dimension, and light so we can see them for ourselves. Special effects like these are a great tool for bringing to life 
the invisible, the invisible wonders, wonders of space. Of space. <laughs> where you never know why, what might be out there. It could be a supernova, or a new planet, or even an astrophysicist coming right this way. Please welcome my colleague, Dr. Shep Dolman, who will tell us about a new tool he is working on to help us see supermassive black holes, including the one at the heart of our galaxy. So how do we know there's a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy? Well, it's very simple. There's an unseen mass at the very center here that's causing whole stars to orbit around it as though they were small planets. Its gravity is so intense and it's so compact, there's little else it could be other than a supermassive black hole. But while black holes in the center of other galaxies are voracious eaters consuming gas, dust, even the occasional star, ours is on a starvation diet. And that's a very good thing for us. <laughs> Because when a black hole eats too richly, it can drive intense jets of material at relativistic speeds that can pierce entire galaxies. And if a planet like ours was in the way, all life could be extinguished. This is the kind of sleeping giant we want to keep a close eye on, and we're working on a way to take its picture. Now, you can't actually see an, a, a black hole, because by definition, all the light cannot escape from it. But what you can see is the boundary, the, the event horizon the point at which matter and light disappear from our view forever. Now, this can't be done with a single telescope. It's, 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 uh, its angular resolution is simply too small. You need a large telescope to see something on the scale of the black hole. So we're working on a way to turn the entire Earth into a telescope. It's a concept that we're working on at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory called the Event Horizon Telescope. And simply put, we're using an array of atomic clocks to perfectly synchronize the largest radio dishes across the globe to make a camera as large as the Earth itself. This camera will have the greatest magnifying power of any instrument ever assembled. All of these dishes you see here, from the South Pole to Hawaii to Chile to California, even France and Spain, will all swivel this spring to look at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. It'll be our first opportunity to see the unseen, to paint a portrait of a black hole. Now, the event horizon is the ultimate mystery. It's the only one-way door out of our universe, and it's the one place where Einstein's theory of gravity may actually break down. Now, it's never a good idea to bet against Einstein. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I am sure that if he were here today, he'd be as excited as we are as the event horizon telescope achieves first light. Thank you. While well, Shep is wiring the world to turn it into a giant radio telescope, we're working on the next big thing, and it's a whopper. This is a rendering of the Giant Magellan Telescope, or GMT, which will be the world's largest telescope. It will be erected high up in Chile's Atacama Desert, where years can go by without a drop of rain. This is bad for life, but excellent for a telescope, because the dry, high-altitude air is crystal clear. The GMT will have an enormous mirror composed of seven segments. Each mirror segment is almost 30 feet across. Here's one of the mirrors being ground to perfection. So precisely that if it were expanded to the size of the United States, the tallest bump in it would be about half an inch high. It has to be perfect because it'll be looking at the oldest, most distant objects in the universe. And it will be peering down the barrel of the Big Bang. Perhaps most exciting of all, we will use the giant Magellan Telescope to find out if there's life out there. You've probably heard that we've been discovering planets around other stars at an unbelievable rate using the Kepler Telescope. Kepler detects planets around distant stars by measuring the dip, the tiniest dip in the starlight as a planet passes in front of its star. About 1,000 known to date. Now with the giant Magellan Telescope, we'll be able to zoom in and look at the light passing right along the edge of these planets' surfaces. What's along the edge of these planets that's so important? Atmospheres, we hope. Remarkably, the GMT will not only be able to detect atmospheres, but tell us what the atmospheres are made of. 
we'll be holding our collective breaths for the one element in the, those atmospheres that will change everything, oxygen. Because oxygen comes from life. And if we find this signature of life, well, that will be the biggest thing since Galileo turned his telescope to the sky. Because we will not be alone in the cosmos, and nothing will ever be the same again. And so concludes our journey to the far reaches of space and back again. I hope this trip has given you a sense of our substantial commitment to this endeavor. From unlocking the universe's greatest mysteries to inspiring a new generation of stargazers whose curiosity will uncover even more, the Smithsonian's journey into space has only just begun. <laughs>